As you're taking your seats, I invite you to open a Bible to Acts chapter 26 as we continue studying God's word about the life of Paul and the life of the early church and what it teaches us. We are going to be in Acts chapter 26 where Paul will recount his conversion story and his commissioning and calling into ministry. And as we open our hearts and minds to receive God's word, we do so by beginning in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that they would be made still by the Holy Spirit and receptive to the gospel and the word of the Lord. Secondly, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ that they would be comforted and encouraged by the words of the Lord and the Holy Gospel. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would preach true and faithfully to the word of God, proclaim clearly the gospel of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So as we continue in Acts chapter 26, Paul has gone from one trial to another. He's been in jail for quite some time, and now because he's appealed to Caesar, which as a Roman citizen, if you were on trial for something, you had the right to appeal to Caesar, which is essentially saying, I'd like to go up to the Supreme Court. And so as Paul has done this, he's moved from one court, one trial to another with a new governor. And so there's a new king, there's a new governor, and they've come in to hear Paul's defense of himself. And Paul's defense is essentially going to be his story. All he's going to tell them is, this is who I am, this is who Jesus is, and this is what Jesus has done for me. And one of the the big lessons for us to learn is that you and I can can do that, okay? Like, you can be like Paul. I know we've talked about that, and many of you still don't believe me, but I'm going to tell it to you again. You can be like Paul. You can follow his example. In fact, he even tells some of his students later on in his writings to follow my example as I follow Christ, right? He says to imitate me. And so one of the ways that you and I can imitate Christ is by knowing our own story, knowing who we are, who Jesus is, and what he has done for us, so that when we face questions like Paul does, when we feel like maybe we're on trial or or people are wondering about our faith in Christianity and what it's all about, you have an answer. Right, last week I shared from 1 Peter chapter 3 where Peter says to be prepared in all times to give a defense for the hope that is in you. And the hope that is in you and the hope that is in me is not a laundry list of Bible verses that we've memorized. The the ultimate hope that is in you and in me is our faith in Jesus of knowing who he is and what he has done for us. And so by following Paul's example, we actually take a lot of pressure off ourselves when it comes to doing the Great Commission, when it comes to sharing our faith sharing the love of Jesus with others. Because if, if sharing our faith depended, and this is kind of a mean question, I acknowledge that, depended on how much of the Bible you had perfectly memorized, how many of you would feel real confident this week? Or how many of you are just really hoping John three sixteen seals the deal? Right? <laughs> I got that one, right? Now, obviously, we want to be in God's word, right? Obviously, we want to, as Luther would say, inwardly digest it, right? We we want to take it in. We want it to be in us. We want to hear it and and learn it and study it and memorize it, and that is good and that's helpful. But when Peter talks about sharing the hope that is in us, he's not talking about, did you memorize the book of Isaiah or not? He's talking about what? He's talking about hope, and the hope that is in you is is Jesus and who he is and what he's done for you, right? And as we're going to see, when Paul shares his story, he gives his testimony. You know what Paul doesn't do? Quote a whole bunch of the Bible. Now, Paul knew the Bible very well. In fact, he most likely had the whole Old Testament memorized or nearly memorized. 
But when it comes to sharing his hope that he wants other people to hear about, what we're going to see in Paul's example is he's telling this story of who he is, who Jesus is, and what Jesus has done for him. So in verse 14, we're going to start there. Paul says, when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And so Paul, he's, getting, he's telling this story, and he's saying, here's what happened. Now Jesus' question of Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, reveals a lot about who Paul was at the time, right? He wasn't Paul the apostle, the, the great writer of scripture, the great church planter and missionary, right? The great miracle worker. When he is saying this, he is letting him know, I wasn't always this awesome guy, right? The question of Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me from Jesus reveals to us what? Well, he used to be a guy named Saul that hated the church. In fact, in the book of Acts earlier on, we get to read the story of how Paul reveled and rejoiced in the persecution and the death of Christians. And in fact, by his own words in the book of Acts, he says, my goal was to exterminate the church. So it wasn't just like he was mean to Christians, or he just persecuted or made fun of them. His goal was to exterminate the church from the face of the earth. So part of Paul's story is simply acknowledging what? I used to be Saul. I I used to be the guy known for persecuting the church, attacking the church, hating the church, which means he was known for what? attacking and hating people and Jesus. So that's really hard to swallow, though, because we know Paul and we (laughs) love Paul. Yet what I want you to see in this story is like, well, this is who I was before Jesus. In fact, later on in his writings in a letter to a man named Timothy, Paul talks about his former life and he describes himself This way in 1 Timothy chapter one, he says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointed me to his service. Though formerly, I was a blasphemer. So that is someone who mocks God, rejects the truth of God. I was a persecutor, an insolent opponent of the church, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. So he's saying I was also an unbeliever, right? So if you just look at Paul's record, his before Jesus history, none of you like him. Just be honest, right? Like, you like the Paul after Jesus, the guy that loved the church, gave his life for the church, loved people, served people, did miracles, wrote most of the New Testament that you and I know and love because it reminds us that we're all saved by God's grace and mercy in Jesus Christ, and that's all good and amazing. But if you knew him as Saul, you're not inviting him over for barbecue. You're not doing it. You're like, you mean the guy that's an unbeliever that makes fun of God? Like, it's not even that he just wasn't an unbeliever, right? He wasn't agnostic. He's saying, no, I was a blasphemer, meaning I mocked God. I made fun of God. I just made fun of all of it. Right? I insulted all of it. I was, a, I was a persecutor and an opponent of it. I actively worked to hurt Christians and the church and Jesus Christ. If you knew someone like that, you might say, pastor, I'm praying for them. But if I came up to you and said, hey, you know what? As your pastor, my friendly advice is, why don't you invite them over for dinner? You'd be like, pastor's dumb. I don't have to listen to him. Okay? <laughs> like, you're not doing it. You would, you would fight against that. It would be difficult, wouldn't it? And this is how Paul's describing himself as he's telling his story of, here's who I was before Jesus. And then he goes on in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says, but the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst or the foremost. So Paul, in describing himself and telling his story, 
is saying, you couldn't create a worse sinner than me. Right now, I've also been a pastor long enough where people come up to me like, oh, and they jokingly say, well, that's because Paul didn't know me, and I don't know why you're trying to win that contest, but you know, just let Paul win and be the worst sinner. But this is how Paul describes himself. He's telling his story, he's saying, look, I'm not loved by God because of all the good I've done. I'm not loved by Jesus because I cleaned myself up and I got my act together. He's saying, this is who I was. I was the guy that hated the church, persecuted the church, attacked Jesus, made fun of God, mocked the beliefs of Christians. I was insolent and totally against it. And then he goes on, but then Jesus gave me his grace. See, one of the tricky things that we forget if we don't remember our own stories, if we don't remember how Jesus has transformed our lives by his grace, is you can become what's known as an arrogant Christian. Anybody ever met one? Everybody known one? Maybe in our own confession we can admit sometimes we are the one. Right, John Calvin famously said there shouldn't be anything such as an arrogant Christian. But what happens is if we only think about the story of it's Paul, right? Like, Paul's amazing, right? This is why you resist me when I tell you, you can be like Paul. You can follow this example. You're like, no, I can't, Pastor. Look at all the good he did. What happens is what? We get, begin to think, well, Paul is amazing. Paul, of course, is close to God. Look at all the good things he does. Look at all the work he does for God. Look how he serves the church. Look how he serves and loves Jesus. Look how amazing Paul is. Or we can turn it in on ourselves and say, look at all the things I do. Right? Of, of course God loves me. Of course God is good towards me because what? I'm good. How many of you think you're good? This is a trick question in church, but right? <laughs> I get it. Like, earlier we said, poor, miserable sinner. I understand that. Okay, but <laughs> if you were asked to describe yourselves <laughs> to a group of people, how many would be like, I'm horrible, I'm awful? Or how many would be like, I'm a good person, I'm a nice person, I try, I try to be good, right? I, okay, you're not going to raise your hands, but I know that that's the way you would answer, okay? <laughs> we, all, we all would. Right? But that's the, the, the issue, right, that we struggle with is that when we forget our story and the story of how Jesus redeems by grace and mercy, we can puff ourselves up and start to think, well, of course God loves Paul. He's Paul. He's an apostle, look how amazing he is. Of course God loves me. Of course God is good towards me because I've earned it. I did the right things, I'm good. Now here's the problem with that. There's a lot of problems with that. One of them is it's bad for you, but it's also bad for non-Christians. Because they begin to hear and feel and receive a message that says what? If you really want to be saved and know God's love, you gotta become like Paul first. If you really want to know God's love and receive his love, you've, you've got to become like me first. You gotta, you gotta put those things aside, you gotta stop behaving that way, and you gotta start behaving the way that I do. And this is why it's so important for us to remember our story, and how it is a story of Jesus saving sinners. Right, so Paul's asked this question, why are you persecuting me? In 1 Timothy, he lists off all the ways he is against God and against Jesus, and then he celebrates the good news. But Jesus did what in Paul's life? He showed up and showed him grace and mercy. So in verse 15, and I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me, have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, 
that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So Jesus shows up in Paul's life. Paul's life totally transforms and changes. Why? Because of Jesus. Right? Paul says nothing of, you know what? I made a choice to stop living a certain way. I really cleaned myself up, fixed everything in my life, and then changed paths. No, Paul's story is, this is how I was living. This is what I was doing. It was all terrible. It was all awful. And yet, what happened in Paul's life? Jesus came to him, redeemed him, gave him grace and mercy, and set him in a whole new purpose and a whole new direction. And then Paul's new purpose was not to go around and tell everybody else, you need to do what I did. You know, he doesn't tell everybody like, oh, you need to start behaving the way I behave. You need to start doing these things and these things, and that'll really get you there. His job in verse 18 is to do what? To tell them that they may receive forgiveness of sins, to point them to Jesus, the God of grace who has forgiven him, and said, this is how you can be saved. This is how you can be redeemed. This is how you can have your life completely changed and transformed. Paul's job in verse 18 becomes simply to tell people about the Jesus who gave him grace and mercy and forgiveness. Martin Luther, in writing to pastors, said the job of a pastor is like being a blind beggar who found some bread and then tells all the other beggars where he got the bread from. The job is simply to say, I was lost like Paul, I was a sinner, I was an unbeliever, I was whatever my struggles were, and then Jesus in his grace and mercy came to me like he came to Paul and he redeemed me and he gave me a new life and a new purpose. And my job, like Paul's job and your job, is verse 18, to point people to Jesus so they can come out of darkness and into light. They can come from being under the power of Satan to being under the power of God and they can receive forgiveness of sin. So the message of Christianity that Paul is sharing that you and I are called to share is not to shout at people and tell them, do better. It's tempting, right, to go around and tell people, you you really need to do better. You really need to behave differently. The message of Christianity that Paul was called to share here in God's word that you and I, following his example, are called to share are to help people open their eyes to see Jesus, to be able to come out of the darkness into the light, to receive forgiveness of sins, right? We love the doctrine of grace, amen? Everybody I meet as a Lutheran is like, oh, we're all about grace, right? Wake up, everybody. We're all about grace. We love to talk about grace. Here's the trouble. Here's the struggle with our sinful hearts, is we don't always love to live out grace. We, we sometimes forget in our sinful hearts and our pride and our arrogance that we were actually saved by grace. Now, I know you don't forget, like if I call you up later this week, you'll remember, right, if I quizzed you on it. But I'm talking about in the way that we live, the way that we share the message of Jesus, the way that we treat other people. See, Paul is on trial, so he's got, this is like my one chance to get the message out. And what he says is, I was a persecutor of Jesus and the church. I was a terrible sinner. And then Jesus saved me. And so now my job in verse 18 is to share that message of salvation with others. To let other sinners know that they can receive forgiveness as well. Right? To put it another way, John 3, 16, you are familiar with this, yes, right? God loved the whole world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall what? Not perish, but have everlasting life. How many of you just, you love that verse, right? It was one of the first ones many of us memorized. It's beautiful, it's good, and it's true. Here's what I know about my own selfish heart. When I hear John 3, 16, you know who I think of? Myself. Go, that's right, Jesus did that for me. And it's true, did he do it for me? Yeah, because I'm part of the whole world and thank God for that. 
<laughs> but it didn't say, for God so loved Pastor Mark <laughs> that he sent Jesus, right? It says the whole what? World. So that would include people like Paul, right? Amazing apostle Paul that we all know and love. But you know what that also includes? When he was Saul and not so awesome and not so amazing, but instead, as he says himself, the worst of sinners. See, our job is to proclaim that good news, to announce to people you can receive the forgiveness of sins. Because like Saul going into Paul, that's what Jesus did for you. You did not get saved and redeemed by Jesus because one day you decided, I'm good enough. I've done enough. I've, I've worked hard enough. I behave the right way. I do the right things. You are saved and redeemed and loved by Jesus because he loves you. And he came to save and redeem sinners. So Paul is telling everybody, this is my job. This is why I'm here, to let people that are living in darkness under the power of Satan know that they can come into the light. They can be part of the kingdom of God. They can receive forgiveness of sins just like Paul did. The only reason Paul becomes an apostle is because of the mercy and grace of Jesus, nothing else. The only reason you are a Christian and not an unbeliever is because of the grace and the mercy of Jesus in your life. So Paul goes on and he talks to them and he argues with them. He talks about a little bit of what's happening. But then he says in verse 22, to this day, I have had the help that comes from God and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets of Moses said would come to pass. He's saying, I'm sharing the message of the Bible. I'm not saying anything more or anything less. And here's what the Bible tells us, that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and the Gentiles. And so Paul is saying, here's what the whole Bible is. Here's what the hope that is within us is, that Jesus suffered and died on the cross for sinners and that he rose again from the dead to provide salvation to all who believe, whether they're Jew or Gentile. Now, again, This is the Apostle Paul. Imagine and think for a moment how much Bible he's got memorized. And he goes, let me just summarize the whole Bible for you, right? So if you have a friend or a family member ever ask you about your faith or go, what's the whole Bible about? That's a really big question, right? (laughs) Most of us probably be a little intimidated by it, all right? Here's a great verse for you to memorize. Acts chapter 26, verse 23. Paul's like, here's the whole Bible in one sentence. That Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. So if someone goes, what's the Bible about? What's the faith about? What's Christianity about? You just copy Paul and (laughs) copy his homework and simply say, well, the Bible is about Jesus is the Christ who suffered and died for sinners and rose from the dead to give salvation. How many of you can do that? I believe in you, right? You might not know all of Isaiah or Jeremiah or some deep theological questions, but I do believe in you that you can tell people about the hope that is in you. Jesus died for sinners and he rose again to give us eternal life. And at the very end, Paul keeps going with this conversation. And then he says, uh, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, when King Agrippa asks him in verse 28, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Right? Imagine Paul sitting there. He's on trial. He's standing before the king. Imagine you're sitting at the dinner table at the coffee shop having a conversation. And they go, wait a minute, are you trying to convert me? Are you trying to convince me to be a Christian? Now, in our day and age, 
the gut instinct for many people is to simply say, oh, oh no, I don't, I don't want to offend. Like, no, no, I'm just, I'm just sharing. It's up to you or whatever, right? We're very polite. What I love is Paul says, yeah, I absolutely have an agenda. I want you to be a Christian. That's a bold thing to say to the king that you're on trial in front of, who doesn't like you because you're a Christian. So Agrippa asked him this question, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul answers in verse 29, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also who all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these changes. So he's saying, no, no, it's not just you, King Agrippa. I want everybody in the courtroom right now to hear the gospel and do what? Believe and become a Christian. And then he's very polite about it. He says, except for the chains. Like, you don't have to get imprisoned like me if you don't want to, King Agrippa. But other than that, yeah, I would like you to be like me. Now, here's why this is so amazing and so important. The church and the Christian life ought to have an agenda. Now, I just said something that upsets a lot of people, makes a lot of people uneasy in our day and age and our culture. But it's absolutely true. The problem of why we have such trouble with that phrase, right, goal sounds much nicer, right, is because so often we've presented the wrong agenda to the world. We've presented an agenda that says, oh, no, you, you've got to be like Paul. You've got to get your life together. You've got to behave the right way. You've got to do all these things. Right? You, you've got to think like we do. You've got to act like I do. You've got to vote like I do. You've got to you know, do all this stuff. That I, right? we're, what we're telling people is the agenda is to be like Paul. The agenda is to be like this. The agenda is to be like me. And then we will accept you. And then God will love you. So the problem isn't having an agenda, it's having the right one. Paul's agenda is very clear in his court case. He makes no defense of himself. He's given an opportunity to speak, and he's like, um, instead of defending myself, I, can I just tell you about Jesus real quick? And he says, absolutely. When King Agrippa asks him, what is your agenda? Are you trying to convert me? Is that what's happening right now? Paul says what? Yeah. Whether it's a short little conversation right now, or if you're gonna send me back to the jail cell and we come back and keep doing this for a little while, he says, I don't care if it's a short time or a long time, absolutely, I want King Agrippa and everybody that hears this message of Jesus to what? Believe in Jesus. Because that's the proper agenda of the Christian life in the church. It's not to just, hey, change your behavior. Become like me, act like me, look like me. You're not the agenda, guys. As wonderful as you are and how much I love you, that's not the goal. That's not the purpose. That's the agenda. The agenda is for sinners to know the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. That's what verse 18 earlier tells us. Jesus looks at Paul and says, I have redeemed you, I have saved you, I have made you mine, and here's your new purpose. They go tell people that are living in darkness under the power of Satan they can come into the light. That they, just think about that. That Saul, right? Remember how bad Saul was? I know he's Paul to you, but remember how bad Saul is? He was so bad, Jesus himself had to be like, why are you doing this, man? Right, anybody ever get in trouble as a kid? And then as a kid, none of you? That's amazing. You really are good people, all right. <laughs> right, I learned really early on that there is this thing in life called the chain of command, depending on how bad you are, the further up it goes. So in my life it was, <laughs> anyway, God redeemed me too, okay guys, all right. But when I was growing up, the chain of command was your teacher, right, and you're in school, your teacher's telling you what to do, how to behave, and then our teacher had either a name on the board or one of my teachers had like a card system and the colors changed and Boy, that was bad for me because my parents would come and see all the, the rainbows by my name, and it's like, uh-oh, what did Mark do it again, all right? And so <laughs> then after that was 
the principal's office. Anybody ever go to the principal's office for not academic success, right? <laughs> and then after that, I found out one day, beyond the principal is the senior pastor. Just let, let you know, when you're in a little Lutheran private school and you go from teacher to the principal to the senior pastor, you're gonna need a lot of God's grace and mercy in your life, because that's when you've, got, you've really veered off the path, right? Now think about this for a moment. Saul is like that. It's just, if you looked at his life, and you saw how bad he was, instead of being his friend, he'd be like, we're gonna put your name on the board. Well, that's not working. We're gonna send you the principals. Well, that's not working. We're, we're gonna send you the senior pastor. Well, that's not working. We're gonna send you home. You're gonna to talk to mom. <laughs> that was the ultimate chain of command, right? And that's how we view things so often, though. Right? We're, we're looking at people as lost causes. It, it's church. You gotta be honest with your own heart. If you knew Saul, ask Saul as this blasphemer, a persecutor, an unbeliever, a mocker of God, and a hater of the church. You would not create an evangelism strategy for that kind of person. You would say, you're a lost cause. Saul's a lost cause, Peter. Why are you sharing the gospel with him? Give up. And I want you to see how, in verse 18, Jesus describes people. He says, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Who's eligible for the forgiveness of receiving sins? It's the people that are lost in darkness, the people that are under the power of Satan, right? It's the lost causes like Saul. And so Jesus comes to you while you are a lost cause, while you are a sinner, and redeems you and forgives you, then he gives you a commissioning and says, here's the agenda, that you would share the grace of Jesus with other sinners. The agenda is not to become like you, to behave like you, or anything like that. The agenda is the gospel of Jesus for sinners. In Romans chapter five, Paul says it this way, very famous verse, Romans chapter five, verse eight. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Many of you probably already know that verse and love that verse and its message. Here's my encouragement to you. Don't forget it. God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for it. Jesus saved Paul while he was still Saul. He didn't wait for him to become Paul and then save him. Jesus saves you and me while we are still sinners. And the good news is that Paul says this in the present tense. He doesn't say God showed. He says God shows, meaning he continues to show his love for you in this way, that every time you and I are sinning and messing up, he still does what? He still gives us the grace and the mercy from the cross of Jesus Christ. And the agenda, the goal, the mission, the purpose of the Christian life and the church is to share that good news with a sinful world. And look at people and go, no, it's, it's while you're still Saul. It's while you're still a sinner. It's while you still don't have it all figured out and cleaned up. That's when Christ went to the cross for you to forgive you and redeem you and give you new life. And dear friends, the only reason you and I have that agenda, that purpose, and that mission is because Jesus did the same for you. While you were still a sinner, with all your shortcomings and your errors and your mistakes, Christ went to the cross to redeem and forgive and love you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your grace and mercy. We give thanks that while we are still caught up in our sins, you show your love to us by forgiving us through the cross of Christ Jesus, our Savior. 
May we follow the example of Paul, making grace the whole point and purpose of our lives and sharing that good news of your perfect love for sinners with the world around us so that they may receive forgiveness of sins. In your name we pray, amen.